In this lesson, we're going to cover four methods for getting this 1, 4, di, x relationship. And so we're going to have two functional groups that are on the 1 and 4 carbon atoms of whatever molecule that we have. So let's look at two methods to make dicarbonyl compounds with this relationship. Take this compound for example. If we number our carbons, we see that each of these carbonyl groups is on the 1 and 4 position. So now we need to break a bond. We need to think about this retrosynthetically. If we cleave between carbons 2 and 3, we can trace this back to a couple synthons. So now we need to assign polarities. This is a secondary carbon atom, and so I'm going to assign this as the negative partner, and hopefully this will make sense in just a second. Now that we've assigned our polarities, we need to trace back to reagents. The first one is simple, it's just cyclohexanone that we enolized. But here we have a cation. And so what we need to do is introduce some sort of a leaving group. But hey, that's a pretty good thing too, because we know that we can enolize and put a halogen right next to a carbonyl, alpha to a carbonyl, smoothly in an in, in enolization reaction. So having a leaving group here will give that positive character. So we might envision this coming from this bromide. Now we chose to make the secondary carbon here our enolate. And this one was our positive partner. That is because Enolate alkylations work much better with primary alkyl halides. So if we had the secondary bromide and tried to displace it with the enolate of this, we would get significant elimination, the reaction would be slow, and so it's really best in your alkylations stick to primary halides. Now, enolate alkylations aren't really that great of a reaction. They don't always go very smoothly. There are a few synthetic equivalents of this compound that work much better in this reaction. Let's take a look at those. First of all, we have enamines. One issue with enolates in general is that they have resonance that puts the negative charge on oxygen, and so sometimes they can alkylate at carbon and sometimes at oxygen. Enamines tend to make this reaction more smooth, and then they're just hydrolyzed after the reaction to form the ketones. Just to illustrate the initial arrow pushing, the nitrogen will push in the lone pair. This double bond can attack at the carbon displacing bromine. Now we have this aminium ion. When treated with water and acid, water will attack here. You can show a few proton transfers and elimination of your amine to give a carbonyl compound back. Another synthetic equivalent that's superior is this uh, dicarbonyl compound here. We have this other ester, so we can alkylate and we'll add a carbon, so we'll have a carbon C-O-O-E-T added here. These are much more acidic at this proton, so easier to deprotonate under more mild conditions. They alkylate fairly smoothly, and then they can be decarboxylated to remove this group. So we can use these as partners in these reactions as well. Let's take this compound again and envision a different disconnection. Say we cleave the molecule here. This might seem like a bit of a weird disconnection at first because we're chopping off this functionality, but there is a synthetic equivalent to this. Now let's look at our synthons. Starting with just this side, if we take this and remember the natural polarity is a negative here, and so one carbon away, the natural polarity for a synthon is positive, and this can be envisioned as coming from the enone. Now, what is our, going to be our equivalent of this? We need a synthon that's the equivalent of a one carbon negative, and that's actually going to be the cyanide anion. So this is the equivalent of one carbon with a negative charge on it. So we could add cyanide in a conjugate addition fashion, but how are we going to get the ester out of this? It's actually a pretty smooth reaction. Let's check it out. We may warm this to promote our conjugate addition and we'll get this product. And now nitriles can undergo hydrolysis reactions and hydrolysis in general, just in water, will give the carboxylic acid. But if we carry this out with using acid in an alcoholic solvent like methanol or ethanol, we'll produce the co corresponding methyl or ethyl ester. So the reaction looks like this. 
and I meant to write ethyl, but I wrote methyl. So let's just hydrolyze this to the methyl ester, and we'll be very close to this product. Just changing out the solvent here will give you the ethyl ester. So our product will now be this methyl ester here. Let's say our synthetic target is a hydroxy ketone. Maybe something like this. We'll number our atoms to reveal our 1-4 relationship. And now we're going to cleave in such a way that we produce an enolate from this side. So again, cleaving between carbon atoms 2 and 3. So here's our enolate. And we're going to make a positive synthon from this other side. So let's look at what that looks like. Oxygen has lone pairs. If we envision it using one of them to make a bond with this electrophilic site, we reveal an epoxide. And you should always be using an epoxide for this synthetic equivalent here. Never put a chlorine or a bromine as a leaving group here. You're just going to have complications with deprotonating the alcohol. You'll need protecting groups. You make your synthesis more complicated. So whenever you see this synthon here with the uh, positive charge adjacent to the OH, that's an epoxide. We can also get this pattern using enolates of nitro compounds. Imagine we're trying to synthesize this. Let's number to reveal our 1-4 pattern. And now we need to figure out where to cleave our bond. When a nitro compound enolizes, it does so adjacent to the nitrogen, and the charge stabilizes it. So we're actually not like a normal enolate going to cleave between two at carbons 2 and 3. We're going to now cleave between carbons 1 and 2. Let's examine our synthons. Here's our nitroenolate. This is super easy to form with just a weak base because we have this resonance with the nitro group. Our other synthon needs to be of the opposite polarity. And this is something we're familiar with. Um, this is upside down, but we have the carbonyl, and then two carbons away, we have the positive character. Here's the carbonyl, two carbons away, we have the positive character. So this also corresponds to an enone. Fortunately, nitroenolates do conjugate addition very well due to their resonance stabilization. So reaction of a nitroenolate with our enone will give our 1-4 relationship. Now, there aren't a ton of natural products that actually contain the nitro group on it, and so we might need to transform this into something else. Treatment with base and an oxidant can give dicarbonyl compounds. Imagine we reduce the nitro with, say, catalytic hydrogenation. Now we have an amine and a carbonyl in a 1,4 pattern. Once we reveal the amine, be careful because it could cyclize onto this carbonyl depending on what your R group is. Now let's discuss one more bonus way to make this substitution pattern. And this isn't really a disconnection, so I'm not going to put it here, but we'll just have it as a little aside. We can achieve this pattern using alkynes. Okay, imagine we do a functional group interconversion here and add an alkyne right in the center of this molecule. We'll get this. Now alkynes can be deprotonated to make great nucleophiles. And so a logical place to cleave this is next to the alkyne. This gets us back to our alkyne as the negative synthon. And our positive synthon will look like this. If we again envision donation of oxygen's electrons toward that positive charge, we'll reveal that those hydroxyl groups can be produced from aldehydes. So for our forward synthesis, we can react the aldehyde with the anion of an acetylide to get compounds like this. And then we can reduce these using catalytic hydrogenation to get our 1-4 pattern on a straight chained molecule.